In this Where Are They Now episode, we speak with Tom Marker, a sixth grade teacher from Ohio. Tom is back to update us on how he's been progressing, uh, moving his students away from relying solely on algorithms and moving more towards reasoning and Mm -hmm. applying strategies when solving problems in math class. After an update from Tom, you'll hear the current pebble knocking around in his shoe as he seeks to find balance when it comes to the expect- expectations he holds for students in his classroom and uh, how he can help his parents at home better understand the why on what's being, you know, what's happening in his classroom. This is another Math Mentoring Moment episode where we talk with a member like you from the Math Moment Maker community who's working through common problems of practice. And together, we brainstorm possible next steps and strategies to overcome them. Now, uh, before we dive in here and uh, cue up the music, uh, have you uh, submitted Mm. your math class pebble uh, that's happening in your shoe right now? I know there's one rattling around in there, and uh, you just want to noodle on it. You want to, you want to get it out and you want to like ch- chat about it. Hey, we'd love to chat about it with you. So uh, join us over at makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor, fill out a couple sentences and uh, we might chat with you here on this podcast real soon. All right, Kyle, let's get to it. Here we go. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. We are two math teachers from makemathmoments.com and who together with you, the community of math moment makers worldwide who want to build and deliver problem-based math lessons that spark curiosity, fuel sense-making, and ignite your teacher moves. Welcome back, my friends, uh, to another episode of the Mm -hmm. Making Math Moments That Matter podcast, where we are doing another Math Mentoring Moment episode. This time, we're checking in with Tom. Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't know, John, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. I distinctly remember this conversation way back from, was it 124? 129. So, uh, 129. In mathematics. Uh, 129. Math I, I guess yep. my uh, my memory doesn't serve me as well as I thought. So 129 is the mm-hmm. episode number um, mm-hmm. where Tom came in and, and Tom had all kinds of really great things going on. Um, and and his, his struggles were more, you know, it sounded like just things that he wanted to make sure that he was doing well. And uh, yeah. in this conversation, John, I don't know if uh, you got the sense that I, I feel like he's in the same place where he's got some ideas, he's doing a great job with them, and he just wants to make sure that he's yeah. doing uh, it to the highest degree that he possibly can. I, yeah, I kind of agree. I kind of agree in the sense that he's he's he wants to obviously the best for students, but I'm going to argue, Kyle, he's not in the same spot. It was clear that he had progressed from where he was. Oh, for you sure. Know, yes. You yes. know, Last year when we had talked to him and and he had back then he was talking about, uh, you know, how to help kids understand the algorithms. And we, we hadn't really maybe talked specifically about the why behind some of the algorithms. He was kind of dabbling in that, Mm -hmm. but then we were, you know, he, he wanted to give kids real, real strategies to use outside the classroom, like things that you could take with them to the next grade, but also in life to when we talk about good strategies, which it was great. And, and then he's progressed from there to kind of keep going in the, in that realm. And he's had, had lots of new strategies. He's been trying to get his students to understand. He's been working with how to get kids to think deeper uh, in this last year. And uh, that that has uh, that has been awesome. And in this conversation, we we talk about how to strike up that balance between setting great expectations for your kids, but then also communicating those home so that parents understand what's happening in the classroom versus you know what they think might be happening in the classroom. Uh, so you're going to hear all about that. So stick around, and uh, hey, maybe uh, you will pick that up as well. All right, let's do it. Hey, hey there, Tom. Welcome back to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. It has been a little while since uh, we spoke with you last. I think it was episode one twenty nine. Yeah, one twenty nine. When uh, when you Way joined back. us, yeah. How uh, how we and just for everybody who's listening, just to kind of recap what we were talking about. We were talking about um, like efficiency in math class. Mm-hmm. We were talking about. 
Uh, I even remember, you know, this idea of uh, trying to sort of get students to kind of be a little bit more open to having that that struggle. Um, we hit um, on things like balance, like the you know mm-hmm. what is the right balance between conceptual and procedural, um, and all kinds of other things. How mm-hmm. are you doing uh, since the last we spoke, there, Tom? Um, I think it's going really well. Um, I, I, I taught in a class this year. We I shared an open wall classroom with another teacher, and they went on maternity leave. So I took over about fifty kids in in one room. Uh, myself, two intervention specialists, and uh, we did have a, a substitute teacher in. Uh, basically just to help out, you know, and, and didn't do much of the teaching. So it's kind of cool. kind of interesting. So, but the year went really well. It was, it was awesome, awesome year and, and things went really well. So awesome stuff. Uh, Tom, do us a favor, uh, remind any listeners uh, who listened a while ago, uh, a year ago, or new listeners who, you know, maybe you haven't listened to that episode yet. Uh, take, take a moment here, remind everybody where you're coming from, uh, what you're teaching, you know, uh, what grade level you're teaching, uh, that kind of thing. We won't go into the backstory like we've done in the past. Uh, we can let all those guys go back and listen to 120, uh, 129. Yeah. That's right. Tom, Tom, what, uh, yeah, fill us in on uh, where you're coming from. What's your role? Yeah. So a uh, sixth grade math teacher, Olin Tangy Orange, which is just north of Columbus, Ohio, a suburb of Columbus, and uh, teach sixth grade math. Next year, I'll be taking on a, uh, an accelerated 7-8 class as well, which is basically sixth graders that are taking uh, seventh and eighth grade math in one year. And so oh, wow. hmm. six grade courses and one Excel 7-8 course uh, with the idea that those kids will all take algebra as seventh graders. Interesting. Hmm. Very interesting. And, you know, something that caught my attention already, just kind of filling us in on your current situation where... Uh, it sounds like there was like a team teaching thing going on. And then one of your colleagues had to, had to go on leave. And, you know, now all of a sudden you've got 50 students that you're working with more than one adult in the room, which of course is really helpful. Um, can you kind of paint us a bit of a picture? Like, how did that go? Like, did, what, was that an enjoyable experience? Do you think that um, you were able to do some of the things that, you know, you had been aiming to do the last we spoke? How, how did that go overall? Yeah, I think um, so only one, I, I teach four classes four four we call them cores. So one of the cores had two intervention specialists in there as well, but the other three cores were just myself and about 50, 55 students um, in an open wall classroom. I enjoyed it. I thought um, just as we got going through the year and kids became more comfortable discussing and sharing ideas and stuff, it really opened it up and it gave us a lot of different voices in the classroom. Uh, but I do think I, I missed the boat on some kids, you know, when you have that mm. many students mm. and trying to make sure you don't let anybody fall through. And um, I'm actually on a new book right now. And I, I know you guys mentioned it several times on, a, on the podcast with the um, creating thinking classrooms. Oh yeah. And, mm-hmm. and Good book. See how it's just going to flip the way I do things next year. I, I think if I had, I read it before this year, I think the 50 student classroom, 55 student classroom would have went a lot smoother than it did. Um, but I have some ideas going forward, which I think will help. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That, that definitely, it, it can definitely help there. And uh, that class, you know, it is definitely, I would say hard to manage when you have that many kids for sure, sh- for sure. Uh, you know, observations, conversations, it's, it's going to be tough to manage, uh, you know, with, with lots, lots and lots of students, Tom, if we kind of stretch kind of back to where you were a year ago and, and kind of, kind of fill in some gaps a little bit along this way as well. Um, that conversation that we had, uh, uh, Kyle kind of talked a little bit about what we talked about, but I, re- what I remember as well is, you know, y- you had voiced uh, some, like your, your goals were to like help kids with, you know, not necessarily algorithms in class, but give them tools that were going to be useful outside of class. And, and then we, we did talk about like how to like hold back on some algorithms and, and, and introduce some ways for, um, you and the students to kind of build some, some conceptual understanding as well first, and then kind of introduce algorithms along the way. Tom, why don't you fill us in on like where you were then on, in your own words, and then, and then like, what what has happened since then on your journey? So thinking pedagogically, thinking about some of the some of the aspects you've tried in your class, and then landing where you are now. Yeah, I'd say I continue to develop. Um, like I don't want to say that. Like sometimes I read things or I'll, I'll see things, and I'm like, man, I already do that in my classroom, and it kind of affirms what we're doing, what I'm doing, and I think it's mm-hmm. working in a positive way. Uh, one thing that's been big is 
and I don't know if I'll use the right terms, there's so many terms out there, but like problem strings and getting students to like, I, what I call it, because I also coach baseball. So in baseball, we teach things like on a progression, right? Mm -hmm. And and one thing builds to the next and you learn some things in this piece that are going to get you to the next step. And then you use those prior skills and and keep adding upon those. And I think I've done that a lot in the classroom. I I was just talking to somebody the other day about like multiplying with decimals and, and starting off with whole numbers and then putting a decimal in and then talking about what that looks like. And so um, for me, I haven't, I've really tried to stay away from the algorithms and not race to the algorithm. Like that's been a big, big push in my classroom um, and get away from the gimmicks like the is over of, and the uh, keep change flip of, of de- or fractions and things along those lines. And, and I, I've really worked hard to try to find ways to teach the why behind it. And then mm-hmm. students eventually arrive at the algorithm. Um, I don't know the exact name. There's a, there's a guy that does a bunch of TikToks. Howie. Um, Howie Wah. Yes. Unreal. And so a lot of what he puts out there, I really like because it helps you understand the why behind it. And he, he does it in, in such a way that I, I try to read a lot of stuff on Twitter and then filter it to my kids in a way that they can understand. And I, I take a lot from him. I take a lot from, um, there's a, a, uh, would you rather that, that I, and again, I forget the lady that always puts out the would you rather, but shows different ways to solve problems. And then I'll, I'll always show those to our students and say, do you have an additional way to add into there? And then you know, is the algorithm the most efficient or the best method in, in this way? Or, or do you have a better way to do it mentally um, that makes you do it a little bit more efficient? I love it. I love it. And, and it makes so much sense. And you kind of made the connection of baseball. And again, uh, before we hit record, I, I said, thanks for wearing the Jays hat, but, you know, making the Canadians <laughs> feel good here. Uh, but, uh, but also, you know, connecting it to baseball, it's the same idea where there might be certain routines in baseball that you do. But every situation may or may not make that routine make sense, right? So there's certain times that we do certain things in baseball where it makes perfect sense. And then in other times, uh, it it, maybe it doesn't, right? So it's very situational. I really like that. So some of Howie's work there, I wonder if maybe you were referencing, maybe it was Pam Harris who uh, does some of her, uh, her strat chats. Um, on on Twitter, which are really cool as well, where the the, the problem she's selecting um, sort of elicit certain strategies. They sort of like mm-hmm, lend mm-hmm. themselves to certain strategies, and uh, I, I always find that really really helpful too. So I'm wondering what is on your mind lately. It sounds like a lot of the things we had chatted about, you've been you know feeling pretty good about them. Um, you had an interesting scenario with your, with like 50 students coming together. Um, but like, what's on your mind currently? So you're reading Peter's book, uh, thinking classrooms, uh, where's your head at? What's, uh, what's that like pebble kicking around in your, in your shoe right now? Um, I think, I think it goes, for me, the biggest struggle right now is, is making sure that I don't have a standard that's too high. I know that sounds probably, I don't know if it sounds right to everybody, but you know, you, you get kids in, in a classroom, especially with 50, but, but even at 20, that there's varying levels of understanding. There's very, Mm -hmm. varying uh, backgrounds, you know, kids are coming from different elementary schools. So they may have heard different terminology or use different strategies. And some may, may just have an algorithm. So I, I just think, um, trying to get my students to be thinkers. And, and I think with the book that you just mentioned that I'm reading now is, is not to rush into even content. You know, they talk about using non-curricular, uh, thinking, tasks and trying to get students to feel, understand what the environment's going to be like throughout the course of the year. You know, what's, what's this class all about? Is it, and, and I got to get away from just pushing content and more about, you know, getting the environment of learners in, in the room and, and getting them comfortable in that situation first and foremost. And I think making sure that the standard is the standard, you know, that, that we want students to think period. We don't want them to get answers. And I think a lot of times I've got to do a better job of working with the support staff, whether it's a tutor, whether it's a parent at home, whether it's an intervention specialist and, and, and just helping them understand that we're not in the business of answer getting, you know, mm. like we don't want just answers. We're in a business right. of, of, of understanding what's going on with math and, and the world and, and things along those lines. So then right. I've been really hard to implement um, like character traits and things along those lines into the math classroom. And how can I, you know, I use a lot of Desmos and there's so many things within Desmos that you can incorporate um, that are, that are non-math specific, but they can tie back into the math. So right. um, I, th- I think that's my biggest thing is how do I, how do I get the, the struggling learner to be in that thinking classroom and to feel like they belong? I would say. 
Gotcha. Gotcha. So a struggling learner in a thinking classroom and you're, are you experiencing that you're, you're seeing kids who feel that they don't belong or maybe kind of, kind of dig, let's, let's dig a bit, a little bit there on, on the, on what you're seeing, what you're witnessing, how, how are you kind of identifying that this is a, is a big issue you want to discuss? Let's say, how do you like, I think every every student feels like the A and A is success, right? And, and a B is slightly less successful, and a C is is non successful, or, or not you're not getting as much success as the A. And trying to get students to understand that, like where they are, and, and just growing from that point is a success. And I think so many times, even as a as a teacher or a coach or an intervention specialist or or, or support staff or tutor or whatever, if the student's not getting all the right answers, you feel like they're not successful in that classroom. And so for me, sometimes I tell kids that um, a a hard-earned C when you came in with maybe lower level understanding, you know, and and, and you only understood 40% of the content and now you understand 70% of the content, that's a success. And so just Mm -hmm. getting kids to see their growth in math and not link it directly to a a letter grade, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it's hard. It's really hard, especially in this day and age is to get parents to understand that like sometimes a hard earned C is a really good year for a math student who's enjoying the learning process. Right. Right. And you know, you got my wheels turning here because you know, you bring up something and I, I know there's people listening that are shaking their head and they're, they're saying like, yep, Tom has referenced something that they're struggling with as well. Um, and you know, I'm going to bring it back to the baseball and I'm wondering like in baseball, especially when you think about a, a, a ball team, like whether it's majors or I know you're in a college ball and, and you coach, uh, I'm wondering, you know, on a baseball team, there's all these various strengths, right? And as a coach and as a player, when, when players are there, I'm wondering what's different about that scenario? Because like, I feel like in, in baseball or in other sports, you know, there's almost like the player, the athlete sort of, knows when they've grown quite a bit. Um, and then usually at the end of the season though, like something that's really different is like, we don't have to say like, Oh, you know, you were a C ball player, you know, this year, you know, you were a D ball player. So like, great, you know, great job going from a D to a C. Um, I'm wondering like, how might, how might we maybe like leverage some of what we do in like sports or in things outside of school? And like, are there any elements that we might be able to bring into the classroom? Um, I'm wondering like, where's your head at? Like, does that trigger anything for you as a coach? Like what, what, what does that look like or sound like for you as a ball coach? Do you have the same challenge or do you feel like, you know, your athletes feel differently about, you know, the progress that they've made? We talked to our guys that, so I told my baseball team all the time stories about my classroom and then vice versa, my classroom. Right, <laughs> right, right. And, right. and, and my job, I tell them, I work really hard to blend the two, you know, like to blend coaching and teaching into the same, like your, your, your goals are the same. You know, you're trying to grow people, whether it's in the math classroom or whether it's on the baseball field. For us, the way I, the way I explain it to our guys in the baseball piece of it is I say, you belong in this program if you're adding to it or or taking something from it to grow yourself. So you're either adding to others or you're taking away something. So similarly in a math classroom, did you add value to the conversation or by being around Mm. the conversation, did you take something that helped you grow? You know? And so for me, that's how you can reflect each day, whether you, man, I really added a lot today. I had, I had a great idea that I, that I put out there or I listened to his idea or her idea. And I took away from that and I'm going to grow from that piece of it. So I tell our guys, our kids in, in the classroom and our baseball players that, whether you're taking away something from the environment or the activity or the, you know, mm-hmm. the experience or you're adding to the experience for others, that's when you know you belong. That's you know, right. just, just try to get something. Out. And I told him just like a teacher, right? Whenever I go to a professional development opportunity, I may speak up or I may sit back in the back and just, and just try to you know, right. take in as much as I possibly can. Can you take one nugget from that math class? Um, and for me, it's, it's to get kids comfortable in them. I don't want to say comfortable sometimes is, is a bad word too, in the sense that you don't want to get so comfortable that you become lazy or, or that you become stagnant in your role. But I, I want students to get comfortable in a math class where they can ask to me the most important question, which is why. Right. And with our right. baseball players, like if our baseball players walk out of a training session 
and we get done with something and I, and I actually had them reflect. We, we do reflections in the math classroom on, on Google, on a Google form and we do it on, on our baseball team. And one of the questions we always ask is start, stop, continue. Like what's something we're doing in the math classroom that you would like us to stop doing What's something you would like mm-hmm. us to start doing and what's something you'd like us to continue doing. And we mm-hmm. do it with the baseball team too. And a lot of times the things that they want us to stop doing are the things that they don't understand the reason that we're doing them. And that's the same in the math classroom, right? Like I want you to stop assigning um, Alex homework, which is a, which is an online platform. I want you to stop assigning that. And if right. I, if I don't have a good reason for assigning that to a student or the student doesn't understand why they're being assigned that, it was probably stop doing it. So a yeah. lot of times you see the stop piece of it, whether it's in baseball or math, it's because they don't understand the why behind what we're doing. In the, and sometimes the stop doing is something that they're absolutely right on too. You know, the mm-hmm. kids say, that. and when you ask that question, you have to be ready to be, you have to be vulnerable, right? Because they're mm-hmm. going to say some things that may catch you off guard, but 99% of the time they're probably right. Hmm. right? Whether it's baseball right. or math. I love yeah, it. Yeah, the, the uh, these are these are great messages. I think that you're sharing with us, and and you're sharing with your your students. You know, I especially I especially like the aspect of you belong here if you're adding something or or you're taking something away. Like that makes makes a ton of sense, and and you've given us some great examples uh, on on how that relates to the math class, but also your ex- personal experience. So, and, and you, you did, you did say one of your kind of big wonders or, or things you wanted to dig on here is having kids feel like they belong in the classroom. And then you also have mentioned along those lines of how do we define, I think, success differently for different people and how does that work in the classroom? But you're also, you're also giving us some great insights of, of how you're achieving those. So, so Tom, I'm, I'm wondering is, is the, is the real issue here? helping the kids understand this or is it helping the parents or where is this big issue for you? Do, do you think? I would say developing, like, I like what you mentioned the parents. I think we, or even myself mainly have to do a better job of really getting people to understand what goes on in the math classroom these days, right? Like how it's really changed for the better and getting, and, and so if anybody has strategies out there, like we, we have an open house, we have a curriculum night, but in my opinion, it's not long enough or it doesn't, it doesn't give us enough time or opportunity to explain that. Does somebody have, you know, something that they put out to parents in an email, but then again, how do you know it got read? Um, but a way to articulate that it's really not new math mm-hmm. that everybody's so frustrated and upset with. It's actually thinking math. It's actually, because I think when we talked last time, we talked about algorithms and I, and I try to explain to my students this day and age, like nobody's going to sit down and do three by three multiplication with the algorithm when computers are doing that for us, you know? And, mm-hmm. and so we would rather understand strategies and ways to do it better. But I think like you said, being able to articulate that to parents as well as, you know, I think at times and, and not so much with me, but just the administrators and people that are going to field questions from parents about why, why are they doing it this way? Why are they challenging my students to think so much? We can get the answer so much quicker if we just write out this and do them matrix or the lattice method or whatever, you know, I can get the answer with keep change flip. Why is he forcing my students to do use manipulatives and think about it this way? So yeah, I think that's a big challenge. How do mm-hmm. you, how do you guys, do you have a way that you articulate it to parents, administrators, curriculum directors, um, you know, math coaches? Yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, you've kind of, a lot of what you said is sort of, I think the answer to this mm-hmm. challenge with, with it, like people outside of your class, like it already, it sounds to me like you're doing an excellent job with your, with your, you know, your players, your team, your students, whichever group you're working with in terms of making sure they understand the why, or when they don't, you're giving them an opportunity to tell you about it. Right. So I love that, you know, that stop idea. Right. So, you know, stop, continue. Um, well, what's the other one? Uh, stop, start, continue. Start. Yeah, there you go. Stop, start, continue. Um, so on that stop, like I, I think, you know, you're doing, it, it sounds like doing a great job with really getting a sense as to, you know, do students understand why we're doing what we're doing? And then if not, it forces you to kind of think like, oh, okay, I have to help that student understand why I assigned that. Or like you had mentioned, you know, you might go, well, wait a second, maybe they're right. And maybe we should stop it. I wonder if there's something like that that could 
um, you know, maybe, maybe it's not ready for it for say your, your parents and your admin, because I don't know if they know enough about it. So like you were saying, it's like they need more time to understand the why. And it's clear, like your messaging is very clear on thinking. I heard the word thinking a lot in this conversation and in the last conversation we had. And really it's all about helping them to be better problem solvers, better reasoners, right? Like to be able to reason their way through something is so key. I wonder if maybe kind of working towards like having an open, you know, call it like an open class after school sort of thing where maybe your parents come in, you actually engage them in a task so that maybe they can experience it. And obviously it's got to be a, you know, a well enough selected task where no one feels, you know, that they're, they're not at a place to enter into the task because that's really scary for adults, right? Parents might come in sort of feeling like I'm not really a math person. Um, some other options too might be even just sending home a short little snippet of something. So whether it's you doing it or whether it's something like maybe a Howie, you know, one of Howie's videos, right? A short little clip and be like, hey, this is like a good, and he he's really great at keeping it short, like a minute, two minutes on why we want to do X, Y, or Z differently. Um, like, so just little tiny things might be enough to kind of breadcrumb that, you know, that, that group, whether it's an admin, who's maybe like not, not understanding why, you know, why, why does Tom's class look different than the way I remember math class, right? Some admin are super supportive of that. Others maybe aren't right. If they're hearing pressure from parents. So, you know, I, I think like, you know, ensuring that they have some opportunities, not all parents are going to engage, right. Or, or take you up on it. But I wonder if that's like just this little thing, like if it was like, call it like a once a week thing where it's like, Hey, here's, you know, here's some homework for parents, but it's, it's not hard. It's just something really easy and accessible for them to give a, you know, to have a look at. Now, honestly, and I, I could phrase this completely wrong. I, I talk to my students about this sometimes, but I remember, I don't know if it was your podcast or something, because I'm, I'm so, I'm so addicted to Twitter. It's, it's a bad thing, but, uh, <laughs> but I remember reading something about Canadian math standards, like almost like power standards. And I thought like reasonableness of answers was one of the things that kept showing up in the standards, in the math standards. Am I right on like reasonableness of the answer? Um, I felt like there was four or five like main concepts so, that all around math. So there's kind of, there's, there's like two, yeah. there's the, the practice standards from common core uh, is Ohio common core. No, yes, yes you are. Okay. So you have your math practice standards where, you know, some of that language comes out through those. And then ours are called the process expectations in Ontario. Um, different, different provinces have different curriculum, uh, much like, you know, the pre, um, common core era in the U S but, uh, but yeah, our process expectations are very, um, you know, very, uh, non-content based, right. They're very like, you know, process based problem solving yes. strategies, all of those pieces there. So it may or may not have been, you know, something right. referring to those. Yeah. And, and I was, I was thinking along the lines of what Kyle was suggesting for communicating to parents and, and, and other stakeholders in the sense of um, I think, you know, when we, when we try to, you know, show people a different way of thinking or a different way of trying things, like not necessarily it's about math. It could be about, you know, other things like a different way of, you know, your batting stance or the way that you're going to, you know, approach the ball. It's, it's, I think people have to experience a small success so that, so that they are then become believers. Like I think when Kyle suggests like get them in the room and give them a task uh, so that they can experience that, that success and go, ah, like that's one way to do it. But I think also you, what you could also be doing is if we can't get them all in the room, cause that might be a logistical thing or, or, but it could also be like sending home or communicating home, like small little successes, like celebrate successes with a certain student and saying like, this is where they were, this is where they are, or it's highlighting a strategy that was useful 
in, you know, in solving, you know, a multiplication problem with decimals, or maybe it was adding or uh, fractions and they had used a, a certain strategy that you want to highlight. And it's like, it's something that maybe in, when you're thinking about Peter's book and the thinking classroom, like that you might, you know, highlight a strategy here with the full class, but it might also be something you're like, you know what, we could highlight this strategy uh, and send that home. So it might be even like a short video could go out to the parents by, you know, whatever your communication method happens to be. Um, it could be just a picture of a work and it, it kind of like a short explanation from the student to say, this is how I solve this problem. So like, like sometimes I think parents get worried at home about what's happening in the classroom because they don't see success. And they're like, because if a student comes home and it's like, ah, oh, it's such just the math is just so tough. And it's like, here's the questions I have. And the parents like, I don't know how to do this because I'm trying to solve it the way your teacher does, but you don't know how to do it. So then there's a fight. Right. And then, then parents like, I got to call the teacher or I got to call the vice principal, or I got to call someone to like, see what's going on here. Like you probably don't get calls from people or uh, that are like, They've either they either understand it or or they've helped their kid or the kid didn't have a problem to begin with or, or struggle with anything. So so it's like, what could we do to send some of these small successes home to highlight, hey, these things are working because because if they can see that, hey, these things work or these things are are helpful, I might be more inclined to be on board to help my kids also feel those successes. So that might be a strategy that you could also communicate if there's, you know, that disconnect that's happening between what's happening in the classroom and, uh, and the strategies you're doing and what's, what kids are showing at home or what parents are seeing at home. That's helpful. helpful. Yeah. I, I got to do a better job of that for sure. I love it. I love it. Well, we've got, we've got quite a few ideas here float, floating around. I'm wondering uh, what might be uh, of, like your biggest takeaway from either your experience over this past this past year or so, or maybe from our conversation tonight in terms of some next steps for you as, uh, as you look ahead to the next school year? Um, twofold, I think. I love the idea of just getting sending some stuff home for parents to see, especially, you know, maybe with a video or, like you said, highlighting certain strategies. Um, and for me, I think it's getting students to understand, like, what exactly fun is. And I've been trying to define, I just got done mm-hmm. with a youth camp. And um, we had youth camp Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for our, for our baseball kids. And I defined for them. I tried to explain to them in baseball, like fun for me is defined as doing difficult things. Well, like mm. that's, fun. Hmm. You know? and so when you sign up for a baseball team, if you're winning every game, 18 to nothing, eventually it's not fun anymore. And so in the math classroom, I, I think about it very, very much the same way. If, if the math problems are always basic and I already know how to do them, I'm just going through them. That's not much fun. But mm-hmm. if I have strategies and I, I, I'm a really good problem solver and I can reason through certain problems that are difficult and I can do the difficult well, then it becomes fun. And so mm-hmm. just trying to get parents to understand that that productive struggle is a positive. It's the only way they're going to have fun. Right. Because we've had, we've had parents who'd say, you know, should my kid be in a different core or should they be in a different class because they're struggling and they're getting that hard earned B and they're showing really good skills and they're developing really strong student skills. They just don't have the 98% slash a hundred percent that they're used to having. Right. And to me, sometimes a hundred percent is very scary. It's like that team that goes 25 and zero in the summer. And you're like, man, right. I don't know if that's a good thing. And I think hundred <laughs> percent in math. I mean, I don't get too caught up in sixth grade scores. I don't think Harvard's calling to ask what you got sixth grade math, but mm-hmm. Hundred percent is kind of scary if you knew a hundred percent of the material the whole entire time, all the time. That's why I think we need to go to standards based grade as well. But that's a whole another discussion for another day because the hundred percent is kind of like I don't understand right. what that says about the student's journey in your math class. They got a hundred percent all four quarters of the year. But totally. yeah, I think I think taking mm-hmm. the big takeaway is just how to communicate at home that w- one that we're taking care of your your math student. We're go- we're going to push them. We're going to grow them. And hopefully they're going to have the right type of fun in the classroom and the right thinking in the classroom. And how do I art- articulate that home so that parents aren't calling in worried about their student. Right. Hmm. Right. And that's, that's a great, a great takeaway. And I'm glad, I'm glad we've come to that, uh, that realization for you. And I think what you were talking about before about like this, this bore, that like there's an aspect of being bored. There's an aspect of being like challenged too much. Like that, that's, that's about 
managing flow. Uh, and and about, I know Peter talks about that in his book about where's the right flow. Like if, if we can get kids challenged enough, but not too much, but also not bored, then we're in the sweet spot. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's an important mo- you know place to be if we're going to build thinking classrooms, if we're going to you know use problem based lessons or lots of different routines. Tom, uh, I want to thank you for joining us here. And again, hey, we're going to uh, we're going to hold you uh, we're going to hold you up here and, uh, and 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 see if you're game for another check in next year. Uh, I don't know. Hey, would you be up for that next year? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I love it. I love it. It's great to see the journey of so many educators. Uh, we're getting so many more of our math moment makers coming back on to kind of update us on the journey. It's so great when we see the growth. Um, you know, Tom, I know we don't know you face to face personally, but just based on the last conversation we had and then hearing where you are now, it's like, it's clear to us that we, we see that, you know, you as an educator are growing as well. Uh, you know, you probably notice like John and I are growing as well. Like we're all growing and, and clearly, um, you know, you're, you're putting a lot of time and effort into, what you're doing in the classroom and every single little bit of that is paying off and it's paying dividends in the long run. And, you know, I think the more we do this as educators, the easier it becomes for us to, to demonstrate that to our students. And clearly your message here that we heard again tonight uh, is very clear that, you know, you, you try to help students understand the why you try to help them, you know, like doing hard things. Sometimes it's very difficult for students to understand, right? And you're helping them to explicitly understand that hard things is not a bad thing, right? That's actually a good thing. So good on you for that. Um, for those who are listening and uh, are looking, they're going, yeah, like, you know, we mentioned Howie's, uh, Howie's uh, short video clips. Um, also on our Math Moments uh, YouTube channel, you'll find that there's little videos, like short videos, sometimes five to 15 minutes. Uh, Like John, for example, just did one uh, last week about um, solving uh, equations on number lines with number lines. So, you know, using little bits like that can be helpful for parents to kind of go through that progression and to kind of understand like, okay, I understand why this is and how this works. Um, so that might be another place for people to consider. Um, but whatever you do, just, yeah, those little touch points with, uh, with parents um, can go a really long way. So glad to hear that you're going to consider that. And uh, my friend, until next time, we will uh, check in with you. And of course, don't be a stranger on social media uh, because we know you're on Twitter and uh, <laughs> we, will, we will see you there. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome stuff. Take care, uh, Tom. Talk soon. Have a good one, my friend. Yes. Thank you. Well, Math Moment Makers, as always, both John and I love having these conversations. In particular, Mm -hmm. you know, not always, like, not only do we enjoy math mentoring moment episodes in general, but when we have a chance to do the where are they now episodes and and hearing that growth. And John, you know, you articulated it really well in the introduction, um, just sort of how, like, there was a clear like shift in that thinking, like he's in a different place now Mm -hmm. than he was uh, over a year ago, which is so fantastic uh, to, to sort of hear. So if you haven't checked out episode 129, or maybe you did, and you know, maybe you want to give it a re-listen, it's so great. And it, it kind of models or mimics, you know, something that we need to be in tune in our classrooms to as well as that long-term change. It's so easy to assess students where they are, and we're just constantly assessing them, but to be able to actually go back and sort of like revisit hmm. conversations, right? right? And it makes you think about, you know, how we assess students. Like, you know, are we like, is it a worthwhile opportunity for us to, you know, record a conversation with a student every once in a while, you know, near the beginning of the year and then near the end of the year? Like, you know, that's one of the big takeaways I'm having is just hearing some of that change. And, you know, where Tom's in a different place now, of course, we always talk about it. The struggle never ends. You know, there's always something new that we're going to be working on. Um, But you can see that he's, he's, you know, making progress on his journey and, mm-hmm. uh, and now he's even looking to try to affect, 
you know, parent understanding of what's going on in the math classroom, which I think is so helpful, right? When you can open Mm -hmm. up that line of communication, get parents on board, get stakeholders on board to, you know, sort of support students and teachers on this journey together as a team and uh, great things are going to happen. So awesome on Tom. Mm -hmm, Uh, Really appreciate him taking the time to check in with us and the Math Moment Maker community. Yeah. And we would love to talk with you. Uh, on your pebble in your shoe, uh, we'd love for you to come on here and chat with Kyle and I and uh, kind of talk about what's rolling around there. Uh, we brainstorm next steps so that you can go back to your classroom the next day and try those or maybe the next year if you're on summer holidays uh, like we are just about to be. Uh, but uh, hey, please do that. Head on over to makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor. Fill out a couple sentences there to let us know what you're kind of working through. And we would love to hop on a call with you uh, just to work that out. So, uh, hey, you can be on the next Math Mentoring Moment episode. Fantastic. And uh, John, uh, people are listening or watching this somewhere. So we're going to ask you, we're going to you know, <laughs> hope, ask you this small favor to stop and hit that subscribe button or hit that like button if you are watching on YouTube. And uh, that goes a long way. If you are on Apple Podcasts, rating and review is super helpful. And uh, we thank you again for taking time to hang out with us for yet another episode. What is this? Episode 186. Lots of math love going around Mm -hmm. here. And hey, show notes and links to resources from this episode, plus complete transcripts uh, that you can uh, read right on the web or take with you. Head on over to makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 186. Again, that's makemathmoments.com forward slash forward slash episode 186. Well, uh, John, you know what that means, right? I know. I know. I know it. Until next time, Math Moment Makers, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us and a big high five for you.